It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to express first my thanks to the Campaign for Social Science, to the Academy of Social Science, to Sage Publishers, and to all of those who help to advance and deepen social science knowledge and increase public awareness of its importance. The campaign is not, I think, simply a project of self-interest for social scientists. It is a project about ensuring the necessary knowledge that should be available for public policy, for debate, and for understanding. This is important to our society, but also globally. Now, I have spent my day dealing not with the sublime heights of social science research, but with some of the faintly ridiculous social issues that arise in the lives of academic administrators. Nonetheless, I have been dealing with an issue focused on public influence and public communication and indeed social science. The issue involves a daft rugby club <clears throat> that circulated a homophobic and misogynistic pamphlet at LSE's Freshers' Fair. University administrators around the country and indeed around the world deal with problems like this more frequently than we would wish and sometimes with ones that are more immediately life-threatening. But one of the things social science teaches us is that all manner of problems can issue in a variety of different complications. Let me mark the transition from my day dominated by crisis management to this talk by noting some of the common themes. Bias and abuse towards women and towards gay or LGBTQ people are of course pressing ethical concerns. But I think it's important to consider that there are also issues on which social science research has cast considerable light. Let me pause just to make the point that one feature of a good deal of discourse that we have to contend with is that calls for ethics are presented as substitutes sometimes for social, political, and other kinds of analyses. The call for an individual ethics is important, is crucial for all kinds of issues, including the one I've spent the last few days focused on, but it is not enough by itself. And one of the tasks of social science is to situate ethics and complement it with knowledge of the institutions in which it takes place, the structures of relationships, and indeed policy itself. We have a better grasp of both what it means for someone to denigrate others and the consequences of such denigration because of social science. We have a better understanding of both gender and sexual orientations. Social science has informed both research-based knowledge of the harm done by hate speech and debates over the extent to which this should or should not be censored and the problems there might be with different policies. It informs us on problems with well-intentioned responses, like offering tolerance to people who want and deserve not tolerance, but respect and inclusion. It has analyzed the relationships among psychological and social abuse or injuries and material inequalities in education and careers. Social science helps us understand the role of social movement mobilizations, organizational and government policies, and laws in trying to change behavior, and also the limits of such efforts at behavioral change and the workings of a variety of incentive systems, both planned and unplanned. Not least of all, social science helps us understand the workings of the media by calling it, in calling attention to, but also sometimes amplifying, issues like those caused by my daft and now dissolved men's rugby club. <laughs> I won't continue with charting the many contributions made by social science in this broad cluster of policy questions, public debates, and challenges to understanding, but the case allows me to make three opening points. First, social science has a public influence through several different channels and in several different ways. In particular, its influence is felt as much in the way it contributes to broad patterns of public understanding and knowledge as in specific policy formulations. Its influence is felt in changing the terms and quality of debates 
as well as in fixed and definite instructions to policymakers or others. Second, social science informs us about nearly every aspect of social life and about how they relate to each other. It is not just on those issues that government officials have chosen to make the immediate focus of state policy that knowledge proves useful. Indeed, one of the issues that we sometimes face in demonstrating the usefulness of social science, hinted at in the remarks from Tony Giddens quoted before, is that the influence is pervasive enough that it shapes entire conversations and seldom is confined to simply immediate contributions to a policy debate on a particular topic. It changes thinking in a wide way. It informs management in many different kinds of organizations and issues of difference, abuse, and inclusion are important in businesses as well as in universities. Indeed, this is sometimes a problem because informing clear-cut policy decisions by high-level public actors sometimes gets more credit and this can distort even evaluation efforts like REF impact case studies that depend on being able to draw a fairly discrete relationship. Third, although social science has a great deal of influence, social scientists are not always very good at understanding their own influence or making sure it is as great as it should be. Take the media. We study the media, for example, and still we don't learn to write clearly or to give journalists information in forms and on schedules they can use. So there is a bit of a task before us as well as before government officials or before others in making use of social science knowledge. Social science knowledge, after all, is partly about us and ought to give us some guidance in doing a better job. I would like to solve all the problems pertaining to this in tonight's talk. <laughs> but alas, I can't. <clears throat> Instead, since this is meant to be a short talk and motivational as well as informational, let me speak briefly to each of five points. First, actually I should say in advance, Ed really wanted me to uh, give a talk on the relations between the US and the UK and the differences between the two, and I'll mention this, but this is not a talk primarily on the differences between the UK and the US. But in his honor, I will start with e pluribus unum um, and the very idea of united we stand. Now, notice that in my opening remarks, I spoke of social science though relevant contributions have, of course, been made by researchers in specific disciplines and specialties, using specific research methods and theories. So the work on gender and sexual orientation or on the effects of policies trying to deal with them is done by psychologists, by sociologists, some of it's quantitative, some of it's qualitative, and so forth. We are much, much, much better at distinguishing ourselves into groups based on these disciplinary, methodological, and theoretical differences, we are not nearly, than we need to be, we are not nearly adept enough at finding common ground and articulating public messages on a shared basis. I would wish, it's not really something I'm going to fight an argument about because I think it's a losing battle, I would wish we didn't speak of social sciences. I would wish that we were a bit more like our colleagues who speak of the scientific method, who speak of science. And I think in many ways we would have purchase speaking of social science that we don't have when we speak always of the social sciences and quickly shift into speaking of our own discipline. And within our own discipline, we take one or another camp based on methodological or theoretical or topical differences. I think we continually undercut the message by not unifying it. Now, all the disciplines are relevant, but one of the issues we face is that there has been a pulling apart. And I won't try to go into this in detail, and I chose not to speak from PowerPoint, so I'm not showing you a chart to illustrate this, but citations across disciplinary boundaries, citations of anthropologists by sociologists, for example, all sorts of interdisciplinary citations, are down in all the major journals of all the fields. I know this best in sociology, my own field, and it's true across the board. 
Now it happens there's been a shift. Anthropology was the other field most cited by sociologists 50 years ago, and it's economics now. But the overall citation rate is down. We are disunited, and I think we weaken ourselves by being disunited in this way. We weaken ourselves intellectually, not just in terms of a PR campaign to get attention, but in terms of our very work. Now, some of this is due to the growth of social sciences. Disciplines have gotten bigger and more internally differentiated, and that's part of why the conversations are more internal. But it is still, I think, a liability and a weakness. We have some specific reconfigurations. There's a lot more links between psychology and economics than there were 50 years ago. So particular rediscoveries are made. And if there were time, it would be worth looking at the rise of behavioral economics and how it takes place. It's instructive because it's a story not just of individual scholars doing what they were doing and happening to find work in neighboring fields, but, um, and not just issuing in nudge policies, but starting with them. Starting, for example, with the Russell Sage Foundation and others trying to bring together groups to make sure that there was communication between psychologists and economists, trying to do some digesting of the work of one discipline to reveal where others might make access to it. Right? Instead of saying, economists, go read psychology, right? developing guides to what would actually help make useful links in different problem areas of research. And I think this is often the case, and it points to the extent to which, in fact, successful collaboration is often a product of relations in a larger ecology, of funders, of policymakers, of universities and their leaders, of academic disciplines and individual scholars, and it matters. Now, I won't try to go off into that story in more detail, but it should also raise a different thought in your mind. We have an implicit list of the disciplines involved in the social sciences, I think, most of us in our mind, and we could rattle it off, and we might make a variety of judgments. It would have been absolute consensus in the first half of the 20th century that statistics was one of those disciplines, right? that statistics was a social science. Certainly at the LSE, it has long been regarded this way. It was one of the founding disciplines that created the Social Science Research Council which was created in the 1920s at Rockefeller behest precisely in order to create interdisciplinary social science. Indeed, the word interdiscipline was first used in the founding meetings of the SSRC. But the disciplines, right, wouldn't be an automatic consensus list. Geography was not included. Statistics was. Now, my point is not that this is right or wrong, but that we need to look more widely and that some of these interconnections grow with fields that we might not previously have thought of as social science or might still not think of as social science, but that are closely interwoven into our collaborative areas. One of the biggest differences and one of the reasons, a further reason, I think, for some of the relative weakness of the interdisciplinary collaboration is the growth of other interdisciplinary fields in which this takes place, sometimes drawing people away from their social science disciplines. Business schools are a big example of this and management as an interdisciplinary field. Nothing wrong with this, except it means that people who might be collaborating between organizational um, sociology, organizational psychology, some other kinds of related studies, are apt to be found in management departments rather than in the disciplinary departments. And the same goes for a variety of other topical areas. This isn't bad, it just means we need to adjust to changes in our academic ecology. One of the biggest changes in social science in the US I'm going to guess with less strength the same thing could be said here, but it's a guess because I'm not entirely sure of it, is that the social sciences have been reconfigured by the secession of economics to stand by itself and psychology to join the natural and life sciences. And this is a problem if we let it happen all the way. It hasn't happened acutely, but it is an issue. Right? Economics has grown dramatically in size. I just mean the scale of economics stands alone more often. Um, it has developed its own complex internal structure right? with, as I said, relatively less connection to other disciplines. Psychology has been transformed by the rise of different methodologies, 
an orientation not just experimental, but linked to laboratory methodologies, to uh, brain scans, to a variety of other technologies that often bring psychologists closer to colleagues in the natural sciences. Now again, this is not right or wrong, but it's a challenge to social science and ultimately to the impact of social science if key fields are reorganized and begin to think of themselves less clearly as social science. The head of my economics department at the LSE, in the name, you know, the head of my economics department said he would prefer if we didn't speak of ourselves as being a university devoted to the social sciences, but would always say economics and social science. Okay? Now, this sort of thing, right, whatever else it may mean about local issues, is an impediment to some of the work we do to have a public influence. And I think that the unity of social science is in question, as well as its influence, its thriving, its funding, and that we do well to work on this. Now, in emphasizing unity, right, what I mean is in part that we need quality, but not always fights that equate the issue of quality with more or less factional positions in the fields. It's very important that we find ways to talk about what is good work right, that cut across specific fields. Every university faces this with promotion committees. How do you compare what is the appropriate achievement for a mathematical modeler, somebody who works with large statistical data sets, somebody who conducts experiments, somebody who does comparative historical research? We face this all the time. We all know it as a practical question. But we have a relatively impoverished language for it and relatively impoverished metrics. One of the things that we need very intensively, I think, is an ability to identify and respect quality across these various divisions of social science, or I think we undercut the public reception of each and all of them to some extent. This is not only about how we talk, but about how we work. Right? It is also an issue we don't only work in disciplines, and in fact, it, Certain people, as I hinted with references to management before, work less in disciplines. Now, it could be that management simply becomes a new discipline, and that's one possible evolution. But we also work in issue areas, and it's worth asking how well we attend to and include multidisciplinary work on different issues and themes. Not necessarily non-disciplinary work, but work that brings different angles together. You look at climate change or financial markets, or urbanization and cities, or global health care, you're looking at things that do not come organized by academic disciplines. Right? The problems in the world almost never come organized by academic disciplines. Right? Funny thing. Right? But they come in a way that requires attention from various different kinds of disciplinary angles. Now we all know that this is good. But it's worth thinking of a few things in this connection. I'll be really briefly empirical about it. Social scientists are, interestingly, extraordinarily less likely to publish collaboratively than colleagues in natural and physical science. It is as though, despite the name social science, we all believe in a 19th century theory of genius <laughs> in which we must express our inner essence in sole-authored publications. We are less likely to collaborate internationally than natural and physical scientists. Now, some of that has to do with the role of intensive heavy equipment. If you're doing um, uh, applied physics and you depend on the CERN or other kinds of facilities, you will end up in large-scale structures of collaboration, but not all of it. Right? Articles, it's worth looking. I encourage you to go look at some journals in the sciences and see the articles that are published by 10, 20, 350 co-authors, right? Now, 350 implies a social phenomenon of a large-scale organization of academic collaboration. There are people who are in that list because of their mastery of a particular bit of equipment. There are people who are in that list because of their mastery of a particular technique for putting that equipment to use in an experiment. There are people who are in that list because they had the original idea. There are others who did the statistical analysis and so forth. And they come from different organizations. They managed to work and accomplish things that they could not possibly accomplish entirely as individuals. And we have to ask about this not just 
oh, how do we do it, right? How do we learn it? Because it is a learned skill. One of the advantages of many of our colleagues in the natural and physical sciences is the laboratory structure of work, of coming up, doing your degrees in the context of laboratories, which are, after all, social organizations in which people collaborate and learn to collaborate. Collaboration is a learned skill, in part. It is not simply an innate characteristic or something that you easily can do the day you decide to do it. You have to learn something about how to work in other kinds of organizational structures, how to write cooperatively, and so forth. And there's actually research on this. When I say social scientists, heed your own research, there are studies of collaboration. Um, there is actually a very good science, um, scientific knowledge of the way collaboration works, right? of the kind of training that supports it, how people learn to be multidisciplinary, and so forth. Now, sometimes this multidisciplinarity goes on all in one head. Gardner Lindsay once famously said that was the best kind, right? But not always, right? And so we may have a social organizational system to develop and a set of skills to learn to enable greater cooperation and collaboration. There's also the issue of settings for mutual learning, of ways in which the relations among our fields are furthered by places of coming together. This can be Oxbridge Colleges. This can be the senior dining room of any of a number of institutions. It's also things like the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences, another of Sarah Miller McCune's projects and philanthropies for which we should be thankful, but not just that one. The other Centers for Advanced Study in places that bring people together and create the opportunity for sustained contact and relationships among people from different fields who can then begin to know each other and their perspectives better. We need respect for different jobs in a division of labor. There are a variety of different tasks. There are a variety of different styles of work. For us to be mostly involved in claiming to be better than our immediate neighbors may actually mean we're involved in undermining the general credence of social science too much of the time. Second point, influence comes not just from decisive findings, but also from synthesis. We seek to know the causes of things. It's a local motto. That's an in-joke to the LSE. It's not even a joke. We seek to know causes of things. We seek causal analysis, but not as a series of silver bullets relatively few findings, even in natural science, few findings and many fewer in social science operate as silver bullets. A single finding from a single study able to completely solve a policy problem or any other kind of problem. It is putting together the findings from multiple studies that is often crucial. We create a larger, more complex model. We try to improve its explanatory efficacy and so forth. And this is another kind of division of labor, even if it's not marked by co-authorship. The many different contributors to a common model, some of them improving explanatory capacity by 2%, some of them fundamentally recasting the way we think about an area is important. We need to recognize it, reward it, and see it. Now, synthesis doesn't need to mean a tome. I think people have an image immediately of a huge and ponderous book or a textbook, because in social science, we surprisingly often leave the task of knitting larger fields together to those who are writing for first or second year undergraduates, right, rather than at more advanced levels including, indeed, for policymakers. What it means, synthesis, I think, should be bringing together the knowledge needed to address problems, not just reporting that knowledge or analyzing it, but synthesizing it, bringing it together from the different formats and different particular studies to enable it to connect to different problems. Now, the problems might be applied problems. They might be purely analytic academic problems, but it's getting the work together, speaking to each other, that is important. We have a very weak incentive system for synthesis. We are much more prone to reward the original finding than the work that puts findings together across different studies. And this, too, I think, weakens some of our impact. In medical science, there's a field of translational research. There have been some efforts to try to bridge into social science with similar ideas. The notion is, um, not surprisingly, that physicians 
practicing medicine are unlikely to master all of the basic science that might lead to better practice in their various areas, and they are aided by synthesis. But it's a kind of research, part of what the name signals, but it's a reality as well as a name, is that there is a field of research about putting together the different findings into usable clinical practice. And that is rewarded as research. Right? It is not some different activity separate from research. In the translational research model, one of the things that is given a lot of pride in place is an idea formulated in social science. The idea of attending to unanticipated consequences. For the sociologists in the room, Robert K. Merton, 1936, the unintended consequences of purposive social action. Merton uniquely coined the term, but not the idea. The idea is pervasive in social science, that there are all manner of unintended consequences to intentional purposive action. And that one of the tasks of translational research suggested is to find the unintended consequences of the original experimental results, which were all focused and usually reported as focused entirely on the intended primary relationship. Same thing ought to apply to us. And it relates to the field, I think a growing but under-recognized field of social science, of studying the policy implementations themselves of learning from the efforts to put things into practice, learning what the unintended consequences were, studying economic development, studying what works in urban growth, studying any of a variety of fields. We learn not only the model that predicts what happens, but the things that are left out of that model that we need to study. Now, it's also an issue for synthesis to bring together not just um, to bring together really the best knowledge of your field, the state of the art, and not only your own last study. I'll tell this, I'll make this point by anecdote, and again, it, it relates to my U.S. life, but it's not a U.S. point, it's a United Nations point. And at the SRC, we created a service to mobilize social scientists for the United Nations around particular issues, including even places. You're sending a peacekeeping mission to X country. How do you get the generals who are in charge of it up to speed on what's going on? Who are the factions in the wars? What's happening? Um, you're planning an AIDS response. How do you do it? So we're mobilizing social scientists. And this was, seemed like a great idea. We got funding. Interestingly, DFID was our first funder um, on a large scale, our first partner funder with the SRC for this. Um, UN was immediately receptive, a queue of people. We had a problem with the social scientists. We would get the social scientists their hour or their five minutes or their chance to give a memo to major policymakers. And they would only report on their own work. Right? You would get somebody 10 minutes at the Security Council, and you would think they would get the idea that 10 minutes at the Security Council, there are two things to know. Right? One, right, 10 minutes actually only lasts a little bit of time, and you had better decide in advance what your main point is. And two, they don't care about your last study. They want the state-of-the-art knowledge of your field. Right? They want to know what your field is. Is it ethnic conflict? Is it communicable disease? Whatever it is, what is the field? They are as interested in what your whole field. We are terribly maladroit at giving that kind of short summary of what the state of the art knowledge is of our larger field. And we wish to start these conversations off and say, well, in my latest study, I found X. Right? And we tend to usually want to knock down conventional wisdom. We usually say that as people usually believe Y, but I found X. Right? And this isn't very helpful to the Security Council or to other policymakers and all that. So we need to think about synthesis in that sense. But synthesis also involves some of what Charles Tilley once called big questions, large structures, and huge comparisons. The framework within to which to situate more particular knowledge. And that's actually a field of study as well. Understanding the global framework in which specific findings apply, understanding the context, which may make a huge amount of difference. We have lots of pursuit of more or less universal law-like statements intended to apply everywhere, and much less research into what you could think of as scope conditions, but which are the particular local context in which they get applied and then work somewhat differently in various ways. Now third, I suggest that relationships are important not just dissemination. 
The idea of dissemination is, I think, a problematic idea. We have a notion that we do research and then we disseminate it. And actually, one of the good things about the REF case study, impact case study model, is that it has begun to counter this. It's not just how many people read your study. It's not just getting it out, right? That it's particular identifiable relationships that matter. We often think that doing the research we want to do is the first step, and then trying to call attention to it after the fact is the model for having an impact. Now, I would predict that if we looked at the impact case studies in aggregate, when people do, what we will find is that that isn't the model. People didn't just do the research and then try to find somebody who was interested in it. The research developed in a relationship with potential end users and others who had a desire for better knowledge. It's a weak model for having an impact to just do what you want and then try to sell it around. We should consider more often involving potential users, not just in the study, because we need access to their organizations, but in the design and development of the very questions asked if we want to have an impact. Now, that doesn't mean that social scientists should give up their role in asserting that one or another frame of the question is better, that there are better ways to ask questions, there are, but that the discussion about that will shape a relationship potentially with end users. Likewise, it's a very weak model to just do your research and hope that Malcolm Gladwell will discover it. <laughs> there are a variety of social scientists who operate on this model for having an impact. They do their research, they publish it, and they sit in cafes waiting for Malcolm to show up. <laughs> Sometimes Paul Krugman mentions it in his column. It's an alternative path. But these are weak paths. And again, build relationships. And even we might think about this not just individualistically, but in the discipline. What do we do collectively to build relationships with people who write well with social science knowledge? Some people do this as individuals. There are co-authored books and there are other testimonies to it. But it's an issue for all of us. What kind of division of labor? I can give another Sarah Miller McCune example of this. When uh, Sarah founded the journal that is now Pacific Standard, uh, one of the ideas was that social scientists would write lots of the articles. It turns out that journalists write most of the articles, translating the social science into a form which the readers will actually read. Okay? Now, we could say, oh, that's terrible. We could all try to learn to write better. I think that's a good idea. Or we could consider that there's a division of labor here. How do we maximize it? How do we build relationships? Do we invite the journalists? Do we invite other nonfiction writers, who are not necessarily journalists, but serious nonfiction writers, into the community of social scientists? Do some people who get PhDs become those writers, those journalists? Jillian Tett, for example, with her PhD in social anthropology, doing exceptional work for the Financial Times. Okay. We have a variety of potential models for building division of labor that is fruitful, for taking into our own hands and solving something that we usually treat as a source of jokes or um, mild despair. Media are crucial to the public influence of social science, but it's up to us to make them work better. I think that is partly relationships. Of course, the media are changing. The old legacy media aren't the whole story. You reach a smaller and smaller audience by writing that piece for The Guardian. Blogging matters more and more, and other kinds of new media, the use of it. But also working with media, like working with government and others, is a matter of mastering schedules and rhythms, figuring out when to release the particular study, when to contract, contact the journalist, how to do this. Work with policymakers and government has the same concern. Policymakers and government are often interested in certain social science knowledge on Thursday. They will stay interested until Friday. Right? One Thursday, one Friday, one week, one month, right? They're interested when the issue is coming to the fore. Okay? Might be longer than two days. But, right, we need to think about that. It has some interesting impacts. Right? Not just that we need to know, we need relationships to know when the knowledge is going to connect and have the impact, but also that most impact comes from work that is already available but mobilized in a timely fashion. Most of the impact of our work can't be work that is done after the policymakers decide that they need to know about something. And we often still, I hear it all the time, and I'm sort of surprised, so 
we could find out the answer for you, give us a grant, is our response to the policymakers, rather than, yes, we will tell you what's known in our community now. Right? The relationships are again the key, but the relationships, we need to be clear, are not just at the top. Right? It's not just that minister that you went to Cambridge with. Right? It's often a relatively junior aide who is tasked with getting together the information to be able to deliver the legislation or the policy. And we need to build these links widely and socially. Now here's a UK-US difference, so move on. Um, one of, in fact, the very biggest differences between US and UK social science regarding having impact is the much greater prominence of think tanks in the US and the extent to which they act as a buffer between academic social science and policymakers and government officials. And they do this so successfully partly because they tailor their work to that task, partly because they can respond in a timely fashion. So the American Enterprise Institute or Brookings or many smaller or more partisan think tanks are ready to mobilize knowledge on the schedule when people in government and policymaking are ready to use it. And the academics generally aren't. They say, I'll get to that in July and August when I have time made free for my teaching schedule, or in other ways, find it hard. It's something to think about and work on. Actually, in the UK, we're much better at that. DFID goes much, much more often to academics for knowledge to improve its development policies than the US Agency for International Development, dramatically, night and day. The connections are better, the ease of contact. We should use that and mobilize it. The chances of having that kind of policy connection or relationship are much better here. There are a whole series of other issues, and I, I promised I would say something about the US and the UK, but I'll, I'll add. There's another that relates even to this very problem in the US right now of the politicization of funding, um, or rather, of funding cuts. Now, this is not totally unknown to the UK. Right? It's just something that's been going on for 35 years, um, rather than three. Um, but it is also distinctive in the US in a couple of ways. Right. I'll point to the, the bigger difference, which is the good news story. The US has a far more pluralistic science funding system than the UK. So those politicized government cuts, or just government cuts out of necessity, because there's no money in the budget, because it's all going into the NHS, any government cuts have a different impact if there's much more reliance on single source government funding. The fact that there's a much more pluralistic system. It even goes to the government funding itself. About three quarters of US government funding for social science is not affected by the proposed cuts in social science because it doesn't come from any science budget. Right? It's the Department of Agriculture funding work on rural livelihoods. It's um, a whole the Defense Department, which is now emerging as one of the larger funders. This may not be what you want, but it is a very large funder and a funder of interest in social science. Right? So that the um, very pluralization is an issue and we're thinking about. There's also the plurality of states. Right? The 50 states make different policy arenas, make for experiments, which the social scientists study, which is often a very positive interaction with policy making and so forth. Now, I don't run out of time to go into this in too detail. There are plenty of problems that are similar, so I point to two or three differences. It is the case in both countries that there is um, an over-optimistic vision of economic development and other benefits from techno-science. Technoscience may or may not deliver on these, but it also skews funding towards certain arenas. In both countries, in this case even more in the UK, there tends to be too much late stage funding. So even in the techno science world, too much of the funding comes at the last steps before commercialization or application rather than fairly early on. But this applies to social science and other fields as well, that the model of how funding and science should interact gets extended from the techno science to the social science and I think works much less well. Um, it tends to exaggerate the role of technical expertise as the dominant mode of impact. And sadly, in both countries, but in this case, I think worse in the US, is a sort of turn against scholarship, turn against more theoretical knowledge, more underlying scholarship. And I don't just mean blue skies, basic science research. I mean knowing what's going on. Remember, part of the message has been it's our ability to translate the general knowledge of our fields into effective policy or an empirical basis for effective policy that is so needed if we only each know our latest new findings, and there is no reward for scholarship, we're in trouble. 
Same thing would go for connections to business, connections to other arenas, and so forth. I'm going to skip that. I'm going to go to a fourth point, which is that the publics of social science public influence are many and varied. I can state this rather quickly. There's not just the or a public. Um, and different publics are reached in different ways, and indeed even by different media. And this is obvious, which is why I think I don't have to belabor the point, but I think we don't think about it quite often enough. I think we have a heritage, and the social scientists in particular, more than natural and physical sciences, more than humanities, the social scientists, sciences grew up trying to speak truth to power, at the very least talking to power, Right? Social sciences were much more state-oriented. States were the actors that social science tried to reach with its knowledge. And so we are at a disadvantage if there's a redistribution of action in which the central state, the national state, is less important in turning our ideas and our work into policy or into influence. The state simply doesn't define everything. Um, this is also an issue about the difference between expert knowledge and a more democratic vision of knowledge. To what extent are we concerned with the wide circulation of knowledge, knowledge informing social movements, knowledge informing campaigns of various kinds, knowledge informing NGOs, knowledge informing businesses, a variety of different kind of actors. It goes, it's a great uh, sort of debate about this, the dewey Lippmann debate in the U.S. context, which was about the idea of the public, and in essence, um, Lippmann, a great journalist, um, so the public was a phantom. There was no public, right? Really everything was done by um, inside dealing of experts. And Dewey, John Dewey, the great pragmatist philosopher, tried to argue, no, publics were sort of evanescent. They came and went, they went, came and went with issues, but there was an ability for scientific knowledge to improve the quality of public debate, to improve the pressures that came from the wider public. Now, you can decide which side you're on. What I'm suggesting is both are important, but we are much more geared up to do the, well, here we are in Whitehall, the inside knowledge connection than we are geared up to recognize some of the roles of the broad public. But they're both important. We tend to describe the latter as popularizing and assume that it's less high-quality knowledge, which may or may not be true at all. But thinking about the insider knowledge has changed because it's very institution-specific now. It's not simply the state in general, right? It's education, or it's the NHS, or it's specific international economic policy-making organizations. How do you influence the World Bank or the IMF and so forth? And so the connections we need to build and the way we need to think of this world isn't just truth to power. It is relationships, knowledge forming, and then knowledge sharing relationships with fairly specific institutions and with institutions in the private sector as importantly as in the public sector. Unfortunately, our historical bias is that we built up better channels nationally than globally, public than private, central state, that is close to the legislature, than in institutions. Fifth point, you'll be glad to know that it's the last point, you'll be glad to know it's short. Teaching is perhaps our biggest pathway to influence. In all the discussions of influence we have, we tend to talk about the impact of research, the way in which particular new findings from scientific research generate an impact. This is hugely important. The new findings are important. The research is important. We need the funding that goes with that research. We need to keep renewing and advancing knowledge. But teaching is the biggest pathway to influence. Almost all social scientists will have more impact through their students' future work and their students' lives as citizens than they will have as researchers, and we should keep that in our minds. But teaching, teaching is changing, so we should pay attention. It's not the way we were taught, and they're not necessarily growing up to be us. Right? We need to improve, we need to rethink teaching, we need to put social science knowledge into how teaching is changing. But it is an area in which to aim for excellence, just as much as research. It is not an area in which merely to avoid embarrassment or to collect the fees for your institution. It is an area in which to aim for excellence, and it is extraordinarily important. So I don't always echo David Willits. But I'm going to close by saying, be upbeat. <laughs> I'm not closing by saying, my assessment of all of the empirical evidence before us is that being upbeat is warranted. I think the glass is either half full or half empty. 
My advice is to look at it half full every time you set out to have an influence. Thank you. Thank you.